Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and welcome to APE's video notes for topic 8.7, which is persistent organic pollutants, which we'll be abbreviating as POPs throughout this video. Our objective for the day is to be able to describe the effects of these POPs or these persistent organic pollutants on ecosystems. And the skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video will involve explaining an environmental concept or process. So as I mentioned at the beginning of today's video, POPs stands for persistent organic pollutants. Now, if we break down the terms that make up this type of pollution, it's easy to understand and remember what this actually refers to instead of trying to just commit to memory exactly what POPs are. So the P is for persistent, which means long lasting. So they stay in environments and in organisms' bodies for a long time. Um, the O stands for organic or carbon-based. Now, typically, this is going to come from production of some sort whether it's pharmaceutical production, so medications, whether it's plastic production, um, but these are gonna be organic or carbon-based compounds. And then the P of course is for pollutants. Now remember, we wanna to try to specify a pollutant. We wanna avoid saying pollution, that's too vague. We need to go for pollutants specifically. So these are typically going to be a synthetic or human-made compounds. And one characteristic of them is that they do not easily break down in the environment. Hence the term persistent. So they last a long time. They can last decades in the sediments in marine or, uh, or just terrestrial aquatic ecosystems or in the soil. Um, and they build up and accumulate in organisms' bodies. And so remember that P in POPs is for persistent. And that's really key to understanding their environmental consequences. Now, why do they build up in organisms' bodies? Why are they so um, persistent? And that's because they're fat soluble. So Fat soluble refers to this idea that they are going to dissolve into the fat tissues in animals and that they're not going to be water soluble. So they're not going to easily dissolve into the bloodstream and pass out of the body via the blood and the urine. So they're not going to go get filtered by the kidneys easily and excreted out as waste, which is the case with many other forms of pollution. So let's take a look at a diagram to help us understand this. Uh, what we have here are POPs, which are these little kind of purplish, you know, blobs that we can see building up in between these yellow blobs, which are fat tissue. And so what happens is they accumulate in this fat tissue over time because they're soluble or dissolvable into fat, which uh, means that they don't dissolve very well into blood. Uh, blood is water-based. And so that's going to lead to them again, building up in these fatty tissues instead of dissolving easily into blood and being excreted as urine. The problem is that over time, they can actually be released slowly from fat tissue. So they could be released from the fat tissue surrounding the liver. They can enter the bloodstream. And then from there, they can go impact other parts of the body, uh, such as the brain or vital organs like the liver. And so these pollutants build up in organisms and they build up in ecosystems. They're persistent. And that's one of the reasons that they are such a problem from an environmental standpoint. So now let's take a look at some specific examples and sources of persistent organic pollutants. So we'll run through a list of examples and then take a look at three more specifically. So we have DDT, which was a formerly used insecticide. Even though it's been phased out in most countries, it still persists in the soil in many different ecosystems. And so again, these are persistent. They last a long time. So decades and decades after they're phased out, they're still found in soil, in waters, and in the bodies of organisms because they accumulate in food webs. And we'll be talking about bioaccumulation in uh, our next video. And so that will be a topic coming up where we'll expand on this further. PCBs are from plastic production. Sometimes they're used in paint additives. Uh, PBDEs are a class of compounds that are used to fireproof uh, furniture, clothing, things of that nature. Um, BPA is another plastic additive. And so if you're struggling to commit all of these to memory, it's not so critical that you have every one of these down. But remember that plastics are a large source of pops. And so if you are producing plastics, your facility may be releasing PCBs um, or BPA into the environment. Dioxins are another example. These are gonna come from fertilizer production and the combustion of waste. So sometimes we burn trash, we incinerate it to reduce its volume going to a landfill and to turn it into electricity, but that can release these dioxins. Uh, then we have phthalates. Phthalates are from plastic production. So again, another instance of producing plastics leading to pops getting into ecosystems. And then we have perchlorates. Uh, perchlorates are gonna come especially from milita military uh, facilities that are launching rockets or using missiles to practice, you know, how they might use them in combat. 
or areas where rockets are frequently launching from. Um, so if we look at some more specific examples, a medication, the pharmaceutical industry is a big source of POPs or persistent organic pollutants. So this could come from, you know, steroids, you know, hormones that are being given to people to alter their reproductive systems, antibiotics, all of these things pass through the human body into wastewater and wastewater treatment plants often can't filter these out all the way. And so they get into aquatic ecosystems when that effluent or that water is released from the wastewater treatment plant. And again, because they're persistent, they stay in those bodies of water for a long period of time. Uh, and then dioxins, we'll talk a little bit more specifically about. Those are going to come again from the burning of waste, especially medical waste. So when you burn medical waste, there are syringes or medical compounds, and those things can release dioxins into the ecosystems. And so again, how do these get into ecosystems? We burn medical waste or we burn other types of types of waste or fertilizer, they get into aquatic ecosystems or land-based ecosystems. And then humans can actually become exposed to them through our consumption of animal products. So we'll talk about uh, shortly here using a diagram, how exactly these pollutants might make it into an ecosystem, then into the body of an animal that we then eat and take the pollutants into our bodies. So here's that diagram I was mentioning. Um, and I like this because it gives a great idea of just how far these pops can travel and how they can actually make it into uh, contamination of human drinking water or food sources. So we have this factory, which we could just say is a plastic production facility, and it could be combusting, you know, different materials or burning them and releasing things such as PCBs, uh, could be releasing dioxins. There's a lot of different compounds that could be released from this facility. But when they make it to the atmosphere, you know, stuck on pieces of particulate matter or they're released in, you know, discharge from this facility, they could run off into surface waters. And so we can follow these two different routes of exposure. If they make it into the atmosphere, they could fall with precipitation either into a body of water or on a land. Then they could make it into a food source such as corn. That corn could be fed to humans or it could be fed to cows who would then pass it through their bodies through, you know, meat that humans eat. And that's how humans could become exposed um, from a food route. Now, humans could also eat seafood that is contaminated with these persistent organic pollutants when it falls as precipitation into their body of water or when it runs off from this factory if they're discharging wastewater. And so this is why it's so critical to try to regulate facilities that release persistent organic pollutants because they can have impacts hundreds of miles away due to the ability of these pollutants to travel through the wind, uh, through the water. And so even if there's not one of these facilities in your neighborhood or your backyard, this could be having an impact on your food sources. And this is one of the important things we have to understand about persistent organic pollutants. Um, let's take a look too now at PCBs and perchlorates because they're two examples that we want to know more about. As I mentioned earlier, PCBs can be added to paints. Um, to plastics, and then they're released oftentimes through industrial wastewater. So if we look at this POPs diagram here, this could be a paint production facility. Maybe it's discharging its wastewater, you know, into a holding pond, but then it overflows and it runs into this pond. Now we have these toxic PCBs, which can get into this ecosystem. It could be causing endocrine disruption or spawning failure in these fish. And then it could also lead to reproductive failure or cancer in humans if they drink the water from the pond, if they eat the fish that come from this pond. And so how is this human exposure going to happen? Again, primarily through the consumption of these animal products, which could be fish from the pond or a hamburger that had eaten grass or corn contaminated with PCBs. For chlorates I mentioned earlier, are more likely going to be found near military you know, facilities or rocket launch pads. And that's because rocket fuel um, and fireworks are also going to be examples of how perchlorates could be discharged. So they could be, you know, emitting from the boosters on a rocket or coming from the fireworks that are falling back down to earth. And so even though that may happen far away from you, it can remain in the soil. So it could contaminate plants, um, but it could also leach into groundwater. So if you're using well water or you're drawing from an aquifer to water your fields, you could be passing, you know, perchlorates into surface waters onto agricultural fields that way. And so the big takeaway here from POPs is they last a long time, they're persistent in ecosystems and in organisms' bodies, and they can have impacts far away from where they're produced and released. So for practice FRQ 8.7 today, I want you to explain why the release of PCBs into an aquatic ecosystem may have longer lasting negative impacts on organisms than the release of synthetic nitrates. 
And the concept that we're practicing here, or the skill is just explaining an environmental concept. And so again, make sure you're trying to go into, you know, at least two solid pieces of detail, give some full, you know, explanation here, don't just write a quick description or identify and really try to compare PCBs to synthetic nitrates.